Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I'm always grateful anytime uh, David asks me to speak at one of his meetings. Um, you know, it's humbling to be in the presence of such great faculty, but it's also great because his meetings and those meetings of Greater Anti-Urology typically reflect what's relevant to people in practice, and I hope that this is in the same spirit. How many people here treat BPH? A lot of you. How many people are using mist therapies, Resume, Urolift, things like that? Okay, the majority. So Brian gave us a nice lead in. So I'm gonna give us a little bit more detail about this one particular technology. So my objectives are gonna to be to go over the mechanism of action. So you understand how it works, so you can explain to your patients how it works. Talk about the evidence in a little bit more detail. Brian gave us some nice slides. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the key procedural steps and I've actually put together a pretty concise video. Uh, it's gonna go quick because I'm allowed 10 minutes. So uh, hopefully get the highlights. So, you know, the devices as he's shown are just blowing up people coming into the office asking about these. And it's important to define not only goals for the patients, but goals for providers as well. So you have this direct-to-consumer marketing. So people come in and they're asking for, for Resume or they're asking for your lift because they saw it on the internet or read about it. So that's relevant, but reimbursement's also relevant. You know, we talked a little bit about TERP earlier, but you know, a lot of us in the room trained when TERP was a big operation, you resected a ton of tissue and you weren't afraid of a little bit of bleeding, you kept going. The average resection for a TERP now is eight grams, if you can believe that. So being dismissive of ejaculatory effects may in fact be costly. So this issue comes up a lot now when people are marketing these uh, missed therapies. 92% of patients with BPH consider ejaculatory, uh, that shouldn't say infection, but function important for procedure choice. Now, we can tell people, well, if you're not trying to get someone pregnant, it's probably not such a big deal, but the fact is it reduces the intensity of climax. After kidney cases, BPH procedures are the second highest for malpractice claims in neurology, and most cases settle out of court, and there's some uh, examples from the internet of people, you know, pursuing litigation or discussing it simply based on the ejaculation issues and not having heard about this as part of informed consent. So, Optolume was first approved for urethral strictures, but is now being uh, is FDA approved for BPH. This is expected to be a big deal. So when Labrie bought Eurotronic for near for over half a billion dollars, right? This was the product line they were most interested in. So paclitaxel is antiproliferative. It's a taxol chemotherapeutic used in a variety of malignancies. It's also being used in uh, stents now for peripheral arterial disease, and it's pr uh, known to prevent cell division and migration. The goal is to get that anterior commissurotomy, it is a tough word to say, but it's at 12 o'clock to deliver the drug to hopefully prevent that tissue from simply refusing after you've treated them. There's a double low balloon like you see in the picture and that's designed to prevent migration so it's in the same position when you inflate it. They do not feel separately. So I met with Dave Perry, CEO of this company at Jackson a little over a week ago and I said, well, why didn't you simply create two separate ports? Because you could emit the cystoscopy portion. You could hub it like a catheter, inflate the distal balloon, snug it down and then inflate the other. So hopefully they'll consider that input and maybe we'll see a, a variation on this in the future. It cannot be used in men who have an uh, artificial sphincter or a penile implant, so that's important. So if you're not familiar with this part of the anatomy, the anterior commissure is also known as the isthmus or aglandular zone. They're at 12 o'clock. Now, the nice thing about this technology is that other than what comes in the box, you should already have everything. No other special equipment is really needed. So you're going to get the pre-dilation catheter. You basically have two balloon catheters very similar, one without the drug coating and one drug-coated balloon. So there's four length options three to four and a half centimeters, and that's based on the length of the prosthetic urethra. Now, you need to measure that. So if you do a transrectal ultrasound, you can measure that. If you do it in your office, that's billable, but if you do it at the time of the procedure, it's gonna be bundled. The inflation device is gonna be used with saline, not air, and you may need to aspirate the balloon multiple times before you extract it after applying it within the prostate. Um, and even before you use it, you wanna make sure to get all the air out. So this is the cartoon schematic some of you may have seen. Essentially, you place it, you know, the balloon is inflated, and, you know, the fuzzy stuff is meant to, you know, suggest the drug diffusing into the tissue. So after the initial dilation, you should see a separation at 12 o'clock. Hopefully, this will be shown a little bit better in the video. So in terms of the setup, um, now, there wasn't listed compensation for the office, but they say that you can do this in an office setting. But, you know, typically ASC or, t or the hospital and uh, reimbursement is going to differ by about $1,000, as Brian showed. But uh, the procedure time is less than 30 minutes. You want the patient to be safely off anticoagulation, standard antibiotic prophylaxis. You can use topical anesthetic and a variety of oral agents to keep your patients comfortable. Now, there's a variety of anesthesia options. The, the Steve Kaplan has told me he wouldn't recommend simply doing this under local uh, a block with some type of sedation. If you have nitrous in your office, that might be a bonus. 
And then you're going to use a rigid cystoscope to do this. 20 French or larger to place the balloon. Once the balloon's in place, if you want to observe inflation, then you can follow it up with a flexible. Uh, as I mentioned, the length of the balloon is determined by your transrectal ultrasound. So you're going to insert the balloon into the prosthetic fossa, right? The distal one's going to be hubbed at the bladder neck. And there's a blue mark to show you're in the right spot because you're keeping that below or out distal to the sphincter. So then you're going to inflate to three atmospheres. You want to stay less than four and wait at least a minute before you take it down. Now, you look back in to make sure you get that split of tissue at 12 o'clock. If you don't, you can repeat this up to three times. Then you place the drug-coated version. You take off the sheath. You wait about a minute inside the body before you inflate it to the same pressure. And you wait anywhere from five and preferably 10 minutes to take it down because you want some tamponade effect. And so you don't need to leave the scope in once you've started the inflation process and it's gripped the tissue. Afterwards, leave anywhere from a 20 to 24 French two or three way Foley catheter for a period of time between two and five days, 30 cc's in the balloon, standard traction for about 30 to 60 minutes after the procedure, and then you're gonna flush to make sure there are no clots in the bladder before the patient leaves. So here's the video I put together. Here's the balloon. You're going in with a rigid scope, right? You can see the BPH of the patient. Leave the sheath. Here's the uncoated balloon going in, and then you can take the sheath out. Follow alongside the balloon. Make sure it's in correct position. You want the balloon to be within the prosthetic fossa, so you have the distal balloon and then the proximal balloon. And then once it's at a proper position, you'll see that blue mark. You'll fill to the designated pressure, as I mentioned. Keep it below four extract this, slides out. Now you're going to go back in and look and confirm that you've separated that tissue at the anterior commissure. Do the same thing again, this time now with the drug-coated balloon. Take that out. You're not going to scope again. You're just going to put in the catheter, inflate, and then flush to clear. So patients monitored. Now, if you're worried about the balloon slipping, right, there are signs of the proximal balloon, the one that's designed to be in the bladder at the bladder neck migrating in. If you can't see the blue marker, if it slides up in, that would be a sign. If it goes back and forth very easily, it's probably not in the correct position. Now, there are signs of a successful separation of that anterior commissure. Be a rapid drop in balloon pressure. It's now easier to rotate. And you might see the heart rate go up for the patient usually around 10 beats per minute. And of course, blood can be seen if you still have the scope looking. Now, it is a chemotherapeutic agent. Be mindful of your hospital's disposal policies for products like these. Barrier contraception for at least 30 days, but if your partner's of childbearing potential, 12 months. And I think that's going to be an important thing to think about. It may impact how many patients you offer this to. BNO at the end of the case, send them home on analgesics and antispasmodics. Now, in terms of the reimbursement, this is the code. Brian showed what was uh, allowable for outpatient per Medicare, and you can see it's about $1,000 less for the ASC. What you might not have seen is that the, the product pricing is about $5,900, so you can see the margin there. Now, in terms of the investigation, the initial open uh, label study was done in the Dominican and Panama, and they had good follow-up. And then Pinnacle, as Brian showed, was sham controlled. So he already gave you these numbers, and it was you know typical inclusion and exclusion criteria compared to some of the other trials you've seen from missed therapies. But the sham procedure was a little bit unique, and I think it sheds light on future research. So they still put in the rigid scope. They still put in the predilation catheter. They just didn't take the sheath off and they didn't inflate it. And they actually had a script read, even if the patient was anesthetized, to mimic active treatment. And the Foley was left for the same duration. And as Brian mentioned, 100% of those patients thought they had active treatment. And these are the follow-up dates and crossover was allowed at three months. So in terms of the outcomes, Typical patients, mid-60s, 45-gram gland, about a third of them had intravesical protrusion, and you can see the AUA symptom score was about 24, Qmax of 9, and PVR less than 100. And then they did an intention-to-treat analysis based on 100 patients. The IPSS was improved by nearly 12 points, but the sham was still improved, right? Eight points at three months. It did start going down after that. But the goal to, to improve, or the study goal to improve the score by 30% was achieved in over three quarters of the treated patients, but also in the majority, over half, of the sham patients. And that was at three months. But I think that's going to be important to shed light on the true outcomes in other studies. So the Qmax increased by 9.7 cc's per second in the optimum group, 5.5 uh, cc's per second in the sham group, and the PVR did go down. Now, it was well tolerated. Uh, the mean paclitaxel now after the procedure was low and undetectable by the time of catheter removal, and there were no issues with ED. Uh, the ejaculatory issues were seen in 4.1% of optimum cases, 2.1% of sham, non -sig not significant, similar to what we've seen with some other therapies.
So key items, it's safe, it improves the symptom score and the QMAX with one year and possibly two year durability. Steve Kaplan's gonna tell us this year at the AUA that it, uh, the results have remained stable. Minimal learning curve, Question about an overly impressive sham arm, possibly due to placebo effect, dilation simply from the rigid scope or regression to the mean. The effect wasn't durable in the sham group, but the patient still had lower IPSS scores about a year after treatment. So in conclusion, it's approved for BPH. It has the highest reported QMAX improvement among any of the missed therapies. And I think that's why it's going to be very relevant for a lot of you who raised your hand at the beginning of this talk. The outcomes appear durable at one and possibly two years now. Um, but as with similar therapies, patient selection is critical and longer follow-up with better numbers is certainly desirable. Thank you.